Amazing. So we are live. I'll do the usual wait of 10-ish, 15-ish seconds as people trickle in. But in, the, in the meantime, as you come in, please say hello in the chat. Introduce yourself, where you're tuning in from. Make sure you switch the message to all attendees. Um, otherwise, just the panelists will see it. I'll just wait a few more seconds. Right, well, we can kick off. So hello, everyone, and welcome to another Finimize Live event. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Reda. I'm one of the analysts here at Finimize, and I'm hosting today's event, The Rise of the Evolving uh, Investor, featuring Morningstar's one and only CEO, CEO Kunal Kapoor. Before we start, um, I'll just go through some very quick housekeeping rules. So like I said, please uh, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, tell us where you're tuning in from, and be sure to switch that message to all attendees, not just the panelists. Second of all, in terms of the format of today's webinar, so we're going to have a 15-minute conversation uh, with our guest today, followed by 15 minutes audience Q&A. And that takes me to my third and final point, because that is an amazing opportunity to ask your questions to our incredible guest here today. So please put any questions you have to our guest in the Q&A box in Zoom. And if you see a question that you like, please be sure to upvote it. Now we go through the most upvoted questions first. So let's all kick off. Uh, today, as I said, I'm joined by Kunal Kapoor, who is the CEO of Morningstar. Kunal is the driving force behind Morningstar's success. Under his leadership, Morningstar has become a global symbol of trusted financial insights. And I'm sure perhaps you can agree with me, me, you, and a lot of people rely on Morningstar's you know, fund ratings, insights, and so on to take investment decisions. Kunal's commitment to innovation and integri integrity has helped reshape the industry and empowered investors worldwide, especially retail investors as well. Kunal, it's a pleasure. How are you doing today? Hey, Rita. Thanks for having me on board. Uh, glad to be here. Looking forward to the conversation. Thank you very much. So, yeah, let's let's kick off. So, you know, a lot happening these days. Markets are a bit, you know, up and down. It could, the macro picture is the same thing. So perhaps to kind of begin and kick things off, can you just kind of share your current perspectives on financial markets and the broader macro landscape? For sure. So uh, those who know me, uh, know that I'm going to deflect your question a little bit here because I think for most investors, the macro environment uh, is just short-term noise. And, uh, you know, truly, if you're an investor, you should be focused on the long run. Uh, you just look back to 12 months ago, everybody was doom and gloom. Uh, and you look at the record of most economists and what they've predicted uh, over, you know, over that period, they've been wrong. And so it just shows how difficult it is to predict um, the way markets uh, will go. Having said all of that, uh, when when you take a step back and 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 you look at where markets are today, I think um, you know our uh, overall view is that it's a fairly decent time to be an investor uh, if you're getting started. Uh, for example, if you're looking for entry point, while uh, equity markets around the world, I, I wouldn't say are cheap, they're also not overvalued in the way that they were two years ago. So clearly, a year ago they were. Undervalued, our analysts thought uh, that the discounts were, you know, substantial. We've had a pretty good run so far in the equity markets this year, and uh, that's sort of taken things back to fairly valued. Uh, on the fixed income side, we see lots of opportunities uh, for yield, which is great. Uh, you don't have to go and uh, own instruments that are risky to kind of get a decent amount of yield. You can do that, uh, you know, in, in in fairly traditional ways. And so I'd say it's a it's an it's a good time to build a portfolio and stay the course. Um, and then just in terms of our view of uh, the macro environment, uh, what, while it's hard to predict, here's what I will say to you. Um, it certainly feels like um, global uh, markets have, uh, you know, weathered the interest rate uh, cycle, upward cycle fairly well. And uh, while there's some prospect that things may slow down a little bit, it certainly doesn't feel to us like uh, we're going to be in a period where we're going to have a significant uh, recession. And uh, I would also just argue that some parts of the market, fixed income, uh, equities in many parts of the world, kind of priced in a downside scenario in 2021 uh, anyway. So sometimes it's it's worth sort of um, disconnecting your view of what the macro environment may look like from the valuations of the various asset classes that you're looking at. 
Thank you very much. And you know, touching on that, you know, strong equity rally, obviously, and I'm sure we'll touch on this kind of later on, but a lot of that's driven by you know the hype around AI and so on. A lot of people are getting excited about AI and thinking about how it will impact different industries. Now you're you and your firm are at the forefront of the, you know, the investment industry. So curious to get your thoughts on how AI is going to impact the investment industry. Yeah, it's going to be meaningful. And uh, I think it's actually very exciting. Uh, just here at Morningstar, for example, we uh, earlier this year in March, April, um, in, uh, you know, came up with a chat bot and uh, put a digital avatar on it. And we call him Mo. And it's been amazing to watch uh, his development these uh, past few months and his ability to take all our data and research and be able to give you an answer quickly about anything we said ever uh, about a particular security, um, about a particular way to save for a portfolio. And you just think about the friction it takes away for investors. Today, if I want to find uh, a security that uh, meets certain requirements, I have to go in, I have to use a screening tool, I have to click in five, six, seven places, I may have to search for it. Uh, with uh, Mo and an AI power chatbot, you just basically say, I would like a security that does A, B, and C, and you get a list, list back just like that. And you just imagine the friction that kind of uh, is taken away. And so it's no surprise that um, people are wondering what the future of search uh, might be, because there's many things we do today that are commonplace, but actually involve more effort than is going to be needed with AI. Um, I will also just say that uh, the other exciting thing, you know, from my perspective about AI is uh, it can really continue the trend of helping us allow people to personalize their portfolios. And happy to talk about that a little bit more. But the technology is increasingly in place where the portfolio you have doesn't need to be the cookie cutter portfolio that your neighbor has. Um, and it can kind of reflect your preferences in a more meaningful way. Amazing. Yeah. And I kind of, you know, like to view it as a further democratization of the financial investing industry to your yeah, point. Well you know, if, you know, before you needed maybe a Bloomberg terminal and things like that, you have to learn how to use it. But now you can just literally ask Mo or some other chatbot and they can come up with an answer. And I'm, I'm glad we're seeing that kind of trend as well. Um, speaking of trends and technologies, are there any other things other than AI you see you know, heavily impacting the ways we invest, individuals invest? There's a few things that are front and center. You know, One is uh, that the costs of investing have started to collapse uh, in most parts of the world. Certainly in some markets, you're ahead. Uh, the US is an example where costs collapsed even going back a decade. Um, but you're seeing that elsewhere in the world. You're also seeing trading costs uh, collapse. You're seeing the rise of fractional shares. Uh, so all of that is leading uh, to a trend of personalization, of not just needing to take an index fund and own that index fund, but being able to say, uh, I care about A, B, and C, and that can be reflected uh, in my portfolio in a very differentiated uh, and meaningful fashion. Also just seeing that because of all of these uh, you know, opportunities and technologies that are coming up, younger investors are more engaged than ever before. And, uh, you know, I remember when I started Morningstar 20 plus years ago, it was kind of a given that most investors were either retirees or approaching retirement, and that's why they cared about it. And if you look at many of the underlying trends today, a lot of uh, younger investors are involved. Uh, you also see a lot of Gen Xers who stand to inherit wealth from what's called the baby boomer generation, uh, getting involved much earlier than their parents ever did. And so you're seeing some very meaningful shifts in terms of who's in the market and how they want to be served. Absolutely. And yeah, that's something we talk about, you know, internally quite a lot, the great wealth transfer to your point from baby boomers to the next generation. And, and this next generation invests very differently, right, to the previous generation. Um, but, you know, on your point, and that takes me to my next question on, you know, people starting out uh, much earlier, much younger, and so on. Um, you've been in, in this industry for a while. What advice would you give individuals just starting out their investment journeys? Yeah. Well, first of all, congratulations. It's incredibly important to be doing just that. And so many people don't get around to it. So if you're doing it early in your um, life, you're likely to be way better off Um thanks to compounding later on. I'll start by saying something that maybe not a lot of people say, Aretta, uh, on your show. 
but I, th I think one of the most important things to do if you're uh, in the early stages is to become a saver. And I say that because to compound and to grow your capital base, you have to have capital in the first place. And you may be the next Warren Buffett, but if you're not saving effectively, you, you can have the greatest returns on earth, but it's not gonna amount to much if it's on a very small base. And so saving is incredibly important and is a discipline you should adopt uh, early on. The next thing is if you're an early investor, I, I'd say do simple things, dollar cost average, uh, so that you are less likely to kind of get caught in the whims and fancies of what's happening in the market. That's how I started. Uh, early in my Morningstar days, uh, I used to invest in a couple of mutual funds and I used to send them $50 a month. And uh, it wasn't a big amount, but I still own those funds. And uh, it's compounded nicely uh, over time. And, and, and just having that kind of discipline uh, keeps you engaged and uh, in, in, in invested. Uh, the third thing I I just point to is you should have a core of your portfolio that you know is kind of a set it and forget it portfolio. But I'm also very much of the mind that investing should be fun and engaging. And for a new investor, I'd say take maybe three to five percent of the money you set aside and have some fun with it, because not only will you be engaged with your money, but you'd like to learn a few things about yourself and also about the markets. And so maybe that's the part of your portfolio where you wanna invest in a couple of companies that your neighbors talked about, or a couple of, a couple of companies whose new products you find cool, uh, or maybe you're having FOMO and you wanna kind of get in on something. Uh, I think that's okay with your play money. Um, and I'd say I'd, I'd, I'd put things like crypto in this bucket as well, is uh, don't, don't, don't let it kind of seep into the broader part uh, of your portfolio uh, if you don't understand it and don't have conviction. That that should really be set it and forget it. Yeah, I fully agree with that advice. And you make a very strong point on the saving and you know, everyone loves Warren Buffett, but you know, many people don't know that one of the big secrets is his success wasn't necessarily his investment picks, but the fact that he had all this excess cash that his insurance business was spitting out every year yeah. that he got to invest right quite cheaply um, right. every year. That's right. um, that's amazing. And and final question for me before we kind of move on to the audience Q and A. And on that point, if anyone has any questions, uh, please be sure to put them in the Q and A box in Zoom. I can see some already, but you know, don't don't be shy. Um, so Morningstar is you know quite involved in putting ratings on on fund managers, mutual funds, and so on. Uh, you know, in the active kind of space, there's this big debate. It's been happening for a while, right? The passive versus active kind of investing debate. Want to get your kind of thoughts on that and and yeah your views, especially kind of in light of the current macro environment. Yeah, so I think the debate is a little bit misguided because it's not really a active versus passive debate. It's really a low cost versus a high cost debate. The reality is, if you look at Morningstar's data and you parse it, uh, active funds that are among the cheapest, so bottom quartile in terms of expenses. Um, tend to do just fine against passive strategies. Um, whereas those that have fees that are above average to carrying one, one and a half to 2%, uh, two percentage point fees, they erode returns. And, and so what I would say is passive is fine and a very good strategy. Um, but if you like active, it's fine too. Most of my portfolio is active. What's clear though, is if you're going to do active, make sure you do low cost active. And also I would just say that when it comes to active, avoid the tendency to chase the hot hand. Uh, there's a tendency to kind of want to buy last year's winners uh, and not pay attention to things like expenses and things like that. And, and, and history has shown that funds that tend to do really well in one year tend to take on more risk, more concentration, and then they rarely tend to you know, do as well uh, in, 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 in following periods and often they gather a ton of assets as well. And you've seen that actually with some very prominent technology investors in the last three, four years, uh, kind of shot the lights out in 2021, gathered a ton of assets and then total bust in 2022, um, you know, really hurting people. So just be mindful of that. So in, in my mind, low costs always matter. And if you can do that, then the active versus passive debate is, I think less meaningful. Makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much for that. Um, all right, amazing. So I'm going to switch over to audience Q&A now. We have some questions over here and I will start off 
Um, actually, let me sort them by the most upvoted. So we'll start off with a question from Norbert. In your opinion, which will be the most prominent megatrends that will define the next 10 years or so? I think it's AI. You touched on that. And, you know, I hate to be cliched because everyone's talking about AI. And so I know when whenever we talk about AI, people will roll their eyes uh, because they're sick of, uh, you know, hearing about it or whatever. But I think it's the, the trend that's likely to dominate our lives and, and change our lives. And so if you're an investor, you have to be paying attention to it. I'd be careful not to go chasing stocks that are just getting bit up because they say they're doing AI or whatever. But, you know, as is often the case, your rank and file companies are the ones that tend to benefit the most from new technologies and find ways to be more efficient, create new products, drive more value. And I think you're going to see a lot of that around us. And, you know, whether it is how you work or how you communicate, how you buy things, um, how you travel, all these things are going to be impacted by AI. And I think you'll be better off uh, for it. And behind it will be companies that you know, not necessarily the next company that says it has a unique technology. The winners will be, in my view, companies that are able to harness that technology. Absolutely. One of my favorite quotes, I believe it's by Bill Gates, which is that we always overestimate the impact of a new technology in the short term, but underestimate its impact in the long term. And I feel like AI is potentially going through the same thing. Everyone's you know, overly excited, potentially overhyped, and maybe in the short term, some things will prove not to be wrong. But yeah, maybe in 10 years time, you know, like pre and post internet, we're going to yeah. be you know, looking at the era pre and post AI. Completely. Um, so our next question comes from Gene. I know you mentioned macro environment can be short-term noise, but curious what you think on Zoltan's recent idea for portfolio allocation as 20% cash, 20% commodities, 20% bonds, and 40% equities. Zoltan was SARS. I don't know who this person is, but... Yeah, I mean, all I would ask and, and say is, does it make sense for you? Um, I, I'm, I'm skeptical uh, of portfolios that meet the moment, so to speak, because they're not portfolios that meet your long-term goals. And really building a portfolio and saving for a portfolio is about getting financial freedom in the long run. And so I always encourage people to build portfolios that do that. I'm not sure for most individuals, for instance, that you need 20% commodities. Um, if you're a young investor, I don't know why you need 20% cash. If you're an older investor, maybe you need more than 20% cash. So it's hard in my mind just to answer and say that X set of allocations make sense, but in general, I'm very skeptical when one set of allocations is presented for such a broad swath of investors in that way. Very quickly, my antenna is up when I hear 20% commodities. That does not make sense for most individuals. Yeah, absolutely. Um, next question comes from Jay. What advice do you have for investors to navigate market uncertainty right now? What steps should I take? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the most important things is don't get too caught up in the noise. Uh, we are our own worst enemies sometimes as investors. Uh, behavioral finance uh, theorists have shown that we are too emotional uh, in our investing lives, just as we are in other parts of our lives. And so we tend to make decisions sometimes based on emotion. And, and one of the best things about investing is you can set it, forget it, use tools like dollar cost averaging. Make sure if you ha have a retirement plan that you're just investing in it not on an ongoing basis uh, and just take sort of the noise out of it. And, you know, sometimes maybe you put in a dollar and or a euro uh, and you'll regret it because maybe, oh, the markets went down. And then the next year, the markets go up and you're fine. And over time, it should work to your advantage. And, and, and so that's my biggest piece of advice is have a, a set of goals and build a portfolio that aligns with those goals and then stick with it. Well said, thank you very much. And our next question comes from Emma. What's your view on ESG investments? Is this still a priority for the industry? I don't know about the industry, but I think it's a priority for you. And you know what, what I mean by that is we all are unique. We all have preferences. And one of the ways we can be more engaged with our money is when our money expresses our preferences. And so it's unfortunate in my mind that ESG has become a very politicized kind of term, but there is so much ESG data that is apolitical, that is useful, 
and that can help you really express your preferences. So I'm very much of the opinion that the use of ESG data, whether it's called ESG data or not in the future, will only proliferate. And it's because it will allow a level of personalization that I think we're all seeking. And so, uh, you know, whatever your preferences may be, um, you can find ways uh, to express them. You may want to avoid investing in certain countries. You may want certain governance standards at the companies you invest in. Uh, you know, you may choose to uh, favor women-run companies. Uh, all these things can kind of show up and be expressed in a way that uh, makes sense. And then you have to decide if the trade-offs make sense for you. And sometimes the trade-offs might be that, um, you know, you gain a little bit more. Sometimes you maybe lose a little bit more relative to a benchmark and you have to decide if that makes sense. Um, but at least you're going in eyes wide open and you're expressing your preferences. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, all of us want more personalization. So ESG is very important in that context. Thank you very much. And our next question comes from Dana. What's a good investment portfolio you know, distribution across different asset classes for a 30-year-old? For a 30-year-old? Uh, again, depends a little bit on your personal situation. But generally speaking, if you're a younger investor and assuming you have put together some emergency cash, let's say six months of savings, um, I would say your ability to be a long-term investor is great because you can write out booms and busts more so than let's say a 60 year old who's gonna need to draw on that um, source of funds. And so you should be tilted towards long-term assets such as uh, stocks. Um, and, and, and that's how I would approach it. Thank you. And the next question comes from Bobby, who wants the inside scoops. I would love to hear about your investment strategy. What are you excited about right now? Are you bullish on any particular stocks or any particular industries at the moment? Yeah, so hopefully it's coming through loud and clear, but I tend to kind of be a set it and forget it investor myself. And I tend to be most excited uh, when things are actually down as opposed to after a big rally. Um, but you know, when I look at my portfolio, it's 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 generally very well diversified, and I own a, a combination of uh, stocks at Morningstar rates highly, as well as funds um, that we recommend. And if I look at my portfolio, one of the things that I feel like inevitably is going to shift in the next few years is that the U.S. market has had so many years of outperformance relative to global um, markets that I think that might shift. And so the subtle thing that I'm doing in my portfolio is maybe uh, increasing the allocation I have to non-US markets, um, because I do feel like uh, in the next five to 10 years, uh, if, if I look at things from a reversion, reversion to the mean perspective, it's likely that uh, there's a possibility that they will outperform. But it's on the margins, it's not meaningful. And certainly uh, I've uh, taken to owning a little bit more fixed income this year as well, because uh, you're getting paid to own fixed income a little bit more than you were. And so I've let that um, inch up in my portfolio as well because it's more attractive. But again, glacial changes. I'm a long-term investor. I, I tend to be heavily skewed towards equities in my portfolio and um, have, left, have let that be the case for a long time. Quick follow-up for me on that, on the U.S. versus the rest of the world. And yeah, to your point, the U.S. has been outperforming you know, global equities for a while. Now. Yeah, I've been wrong about that for about two decades as well. So, <laughs> Absolutely. But, you know, I'm going to be right eventually. <laughs> <laughs> at some point, right? Um, but, you know, you, you said earlier you're very excited about AI and so on. And obviously, if you look at the U.S. stock market from a sector composition point of view, a lot more tech companies... Uh, at the forefront of AI. Um, can, can you make the argument that perhaps, you know, because of that sector composition, the US could potentially keep on outperforming if, you know, if it's going to be all about AI or are there other yeah, kinds of- Yeah, it's possible. Things? But if you go back to the point I was making earlier around the fact that it's often your rank and file companies that benefit most from new technologies. And so I don't think the benefits are solely captured in the tech sector. And I would argue that many of the benefits are disproportionately captured outside tech. You may have a couple of big winners in tech. NVIDIA has been a big winner. But, you know, our analysts don't think its current valuation is um, screamingly attractive. And so those kinds of companies, 
you tend to hear about and want to invest in after they've shot up a lot. And uh, I'd, I'd, I'd rather sort of have a diversified portfolio and um, approach it that way. So instead of focusing purely on the company selling AI hardware or software, you're, do you think you know your normal company will benefit by cutting costs or improving revenue because, by yeah, utilizing exactly. AI? Imagine how products can be changed to you know uh, improve the user experience. It's good for uh, index investors as well, I guess, right? Yeah, it should be good all around. Nice. And speaking of index investors, the next question comes from Dana, uh, who's asking what's considered low fees. Um, perhaps, yeah, maybe you can touch on that on the passive or yeah. on the active front. Well, it really, again, depends what asset class you're looking at. What I would say is if you're looking at broad um, index funds that cover um, very liquid markets, there's really no reason to be paying more than 10 to 20 basis points uh, at most for those investments. When you start getting into less liquid uh, markets, such as EM, it tends to shift between 20 to 50 basis points. Uh, fixed income tends to also sort of be in that 10 to 30 basis point range for passive. Uh, so you're not paying very much. And uh, especially with passive strategies, I would be very, very cautious if they're charging you um, anything about, about 50 basis points, even for less liquid strategies. Absolutely. Next question comes from G. What are the main tips to use Morningstar to help make me a better investor? Well, I, I think uh, one of the ways to use us is to think about our philosophy and approach, which I've been trying to touch on, which is long-term oriented, stay the course, don't get too caught up in the hype, um, increase your allocation to asset classes when they're undervalued as opposed to when they're in favor. You know, we've done this study uh, every year for several decades now called Buy the Unloved, where we look at the three asset classes or Morningstar categories that uh, had the most um, outflows in the previous uh, couple of years. And inevitably, if you look at that, um, they tend to be then in favor for the following three-year period. And so we're big fans of trying to be a little bit, um, you know, contrarian uh, in that approach. But um, that those those are some some hallmarks of how I sort of describe my strategy. And then, as I said, save. Absolutely. Yeah. For most uh, investors, too, tax sheltered uh, invest investments are incredibly important because taxes can eat away um, at your returns. And so, to the extent that you start saving, start by making sure you're sheltering um, your investments uh, to the extent possible uh, from taxes. Absolutely. And I think we have time for one last question. And I'm going to go for this one from Anna. Geographically, which market intrigues you the most and why? So out of the US, Europe, Africa, Asia, or, or anything yeah. else? There's not a market that intrigues me. And I sort of stay away from it. But my theme, if, if you're a diversified investor, I'd look to maybe rebalance a little bit out of the US to non-US markets. Uh, by a couple of percentage points is what I would sort of venture to suggest is a good idea. I, I would not get in the game of picking one market or the other. It's too hard. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I'm afraid that's all the time we have today. We have even more questions, but unfortunately not enough time to get through them. Um, but hopefully we went through the most upvoted ones and now it's you know, quite handy. Thank you all for joining us. And I hope this has been you know enlightening and informative. Um, Kunal, thank you so much. That yeah, thanks I, for I, having I me. Love, Enjoyed it. Yeah, I love that discussion. I learned a lot. I hope everyone learned a lot as well. Thank you very much. Please remember to fill out the feedback form. that will pop up on your screen when this ends. Once again, hope you enjoyed this. And once again, Kunal, thank you so much for being with us and sharing your insights with us today. Yeah, have a great day, everyone. Thank you all. Have a great day. Bye-bye.